good morning and welcome to this, the eighth installment of Wired's live living room sessions. On Tuesday, Jen Ward from CPRI and Ursula Artsman from Soul Food Forest Farms all the way in Switzerland explored the relatively new world of syntropic farming. If you missed that session, you can go to Wired Barbados' YouTube channel for the full recording. If you're joining us for the first time, a special and warm welcome to you. In these sessions, every Tuesday at 1 p.m. and Thursday at 11 a.m., we have been exploring the topics of regenerative agriculture, climate change, building biodiversity, and renewable energy. As we shift into phase two of the Government of Barbados's COVID-19 strategy, we are looking to you to tell us when is the best time for our segment. So be sure to participate in the polls on our Instagram and Facebook pages. It's as easy as one click just to tell us what you think. And we promise we have been listening. So we heard your calls for an alternative platform and we are now streaming this session live on YouTube. My name is Keisha Farnham and I am from Walker's Institute for Regenerative Research, Education and Design, WIRED. And we are pleased to bring you this series in collaboration with our education partners, the Caribbean Permaculture Research Institute, and powered by the Inter-American Development Bank. Today's topic is Biodiversity Matters, Planting for the Future. And to lead us in this discussion, we have the very hardworking Dr. Sonia Peter. Dr. Peter is the founder and executive director of Biocultural Education and Research Program, a nonprofit organization promoting the conservation of plant biodiversity in Barbados through education and research. Dr. Peter is also organized, has also organized the Symposium on Plants and Planting for the Future, held at Peg Farm and Nature Reserve in April 2019. As the founding executive director of Bioscience Barbados Limited and the founder of Heritage Teas Barbados, Dr. Peter also consults on the sustainable utilization of local plant stocks, organizes workshops on medicinal teas of Barbados, and develops course material on plant conservation and sustainable product development. So you can see why I call her the very hardworking Dr. Sonia Peter. Dr. Peter, welcome to our session. It is such a pleasure to have you with us. How are you Good doing today? Good morning, Keisha. Good morning, audience. It's a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this exchange for a few days and um, I'm doing pretty good this morning. Ah, oh, that's excellent. So we're just going to jump straight into the discussion because there will be ample opportunity for you to be able to talk about the work that you're doing um, both here in Barbados and further seas. Um, you know, I've, in looking through your work and in reading through your work, I see that you use the term new use agriculture. So let's start there because I think that that lays a really good foundation for the amazing work that you've been doing. So how do you define new use agriculture and what is the link between this concept and biodiversity diversification? Um, thank you again, Keisha. Um, I would just like to um, address that introduction a bit um, to my defense. It looks like a lot that I'm doing, but it's all interconnected. Uh, because I'm looking at the mass of our plant biodiversity. I'm looking at the heritage associated with that, mm -hmm. bring that traditional knowledge into um, current dynamic. You use agriculture, um, I will tell you, is not a new term. It was actually coined by Professor Jim Simon of Rutgers University. And I was, um, I would, was going to say lucky, but I'm always looking for knowledge products that I can gain from. And I attended um, a very informative uh, workshop um, around 2007 at Rutgers University. And there I saw how they recognized that it was important to look at the sum total of our plant species and how we can bring more of them into agriculture. So when we say new use agriculture, we're looking at those species that are underutilized, how we can bring them into domestication and explore the, the value of these plants. What are the platforms that we can put those plants to use? Oh, excellent. Yes. So, so, I'm so, sorry, I, I didn't address the second part of that. Yes. 
Yeah, and biodiversity diversification. So we know that um, currently we've got uh, between 250 to 300,000 edible plant species, but we actually rely on very few of those. Um, I saw in a document from the Food and Agricultural Organization that was re released around the turn of the century that we are actually relying on about 200 of that um, total group of edible plants. And it therefore means that if we do not add value to the plants that we have there, then we have no vested interest um, in bringing those plants into usage. And if we don't use them, we're going to lose them. And so it's about expanding uh, the families of plants, the species of plants that we're using and if we do that, then we are contributing to our biodiversity conservation. Oh, excellent. So you you speak about you speak about um, underutilized plants. Um, yes. And the reintroduction of those underutilized plants into the food cycle and farming right. and agricultural research. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yes. Um, I first want to say that we must look at agriculture. Uh, not only in terms of providing us with food, because we know that plants um, have been used for throughout civilization for everything we could think of. Uh, plants has, have been a source of our clothing. We yeah. use them for fibers. Um, we use them for medicines. Uh, we use them for building. Um, and most of all, they provide our atmosphere. They provide cooling. So we've got to look at, again, the sum total of the uses of our plants. And therefore, when you look at agriculture, we're looking at growing plants for other uses in addition to food. Um, in our um, project, one of our projects, we're working at Neal's Plantation. And Neal's Plantation is being managed um, by the enterprising couple of Bernice and uh, Peter Chase. And uh, what they're doing there, they're pulling their expertise together. Uh, Peter is well versed on how we can make the land productive. And Bernice is very creative at how we can use plants that we do not normally use. Mm -hmm. And as one example, um, that of Pusli um, or Portulaca oleracea. Uh, which we consider as a weed. It's a diminutive herb, it's a, a succulent, small leaves, um, very yellow, showy flowers. And we see that as a weed. But in our past history, uh, that was part of the food cycle. Uh, we hear issue about it containing a group of compounds called oxalates, uh, but that is not peculiar. There are other um, plants that we use as fruit and vegetables. We know cassava. Um, which also has cyanide in it, but we know how to use it. Yeah. Um, so these oxalates should not be a deterrent because as long as you know how to use it, what is stopping us from bringing it back into the food cycle is how does it grow? When we talk about domestication, uh, mm -hmm. we need to know how it grows. We need to know um, what is the preference in terms of soil, in terms of micronutrients required for its growth. And then we need to look at agro-processing. How do we process that? as we bring it back into the food cycle. So when yeah. it's underutilized species, that's one of the ones that we're actually looking at. So I'm seeing here uh, uh, several different elements. I'm seeing plants in terms of agri-product. I'm seeing plants, um, agri-product development. I'm seeing plants in terms of biofuel modalities. I'm seeing plants yes. in terms of nutritional supplements. And then I'm also Correct. seeing plant-based therapies. Right. Yeah. So, if I, yeah, so if I could elaborate on the post then, yeah. um, our, our project is multifaceted. And right. like I said, we need to look at agriculture beyond um, just looking at the plants as a source of food because we always need to maximize our resources. So in addition to bringing plants back into the food cycle, we're asking the questions and finding solutions and, you know, answers to those questions. So what else can we put these plants to use? Yeah. So um, I was challenged with thinking about um, biofuel and I decided not to um, pursue biofuel in, in the normal way in terms of you producing a liquid that we can put um, for energy 
energy um, supplies. Um, I decided to look at it in a different way, and we are going to try to produce uh, biofuel in briquette form. Now, in order to do that, we need to look at what um, trees are there, what plants are there, that will provide us the vehicles we need to do that. Um, and right now, we are at the point where we are taking uh, bore samples of selected trees, um, looking for um, resinous materials that would support combustion. Um, there are some that we have targeted in terms of using their seed oil to promote that combustion. And then we need a natural vehicle to bind all of that together. So mm -hmm. we have to give out all of our secrets. Um, that's what we're looking at. In, <laughs> in terms of health products, we know that um, there are about 100 of our plants that have been found to have. And I argue that people have been using these plants, doing their form of science and experimentation. And that traditional knowledge, we need to have a second look at that and how we can apply it. So right. in terms of that modality, uh, we're actually looking at um, anti-diabetic therapies. And it may sound a bit grand, but I always say, um, you know, once you have an idea and you have a will, you'll find a way <laughs> to get your product out there. So yeah. we've got a, a number of modalities we're looking at. Um, I suppose I can say that one is going to be a specialty tea. And yeah. this tea is going to be compared to a current agent that is used to treat some of the symptoms for diabetes. And um, yeah. Barbados uh, has the highest case of diabetes yeah. per capita, right? Correct. The yes. Caribbean. So that is something that's very much needed at this point in time. Correct. And yeah. there's another um, issue that bothers me, and I speak on it quite often, and related to diabetes as well, in terms of diabetic foot ulcer. And mm -hmm. um, I, you also have uh, high impact to the loss of limb as yes, well. Yeah, correct. Um, but a lot of the issue there is the healing process. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that the move towards amputation is because of that healing process. Um, but I've got my eyes on a group of plants that were used uh, throughout slavery for healing. Yeah. And um, not surprising to me, um, in all of the response to COVID-19, one of those plants has been identified within a, a community, a nation community, as uh, being useful for its anti-inflammatory properties. And this is the same basis on which I'm employing this particular group of plants. If you can limit the anti-inflammatory response, that's the response that's going to give to what we call inflammation or um, in local terms, pus. If yeah. you limit that, then you give the wound a chance to heal. Yeah. And it may then allow other medications to be more efficacious. Yeah. So looking at, um, we call that a prophylactic for diabetic foot ulcer. Again, it's sounding grand, but I think once you have rich ideas, rich ideas can give birth to something amazing. So. I mean, you know, listening to everything that you've been saying, um, you know, there are a couple of things that are, are, are jumping out at me. Um, yeah. at, at Wired, our um, founder, um, our founding director loves to use the term stacking functions. Yes. Um, and I am hearing so much stacking of functions happening yeah. with the way that you, um, with, the, with the way that you, 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 you use your plants, right? That's um, right. But there's also something else that you that I want I, I want us to get into a little bit more that I that you mentioned and that's the, the traditional knowledge the traditional yes. use of chemicals within plants um, and right. in your book uh, the seed under the leaf Correct. you acknowledge the value of biological and chemical heritage and tradition that has contributed to the longevity of a population of hardworking nation, nation builders. Um, and looking at that key element, that biocultural element, um, what is the what role does culture, um, the acknowledgement of heritage and tradition play within the landscape of the new use agriculture framework that you've been describing? Yes, um, I'd like to uh, draw reference to a study done. Um, this is probably about a, a decade, published about a decade ago, looking at the link between biodiversity and culture. 
And it was within that, it was a broad-based study. What they were able to show um, is that communities or territories where there was great language diversity, there was matching great biodiversity. And one of these places is in Madagascar. And um, not surprising um, that they've developed what they consider a tea based on biocultural knowledge that is being useful for um, COVID-19. Um, I, I use that as a reference. Um, knowledge uh, is conveyed through language and communication. And um, this is where um, that heritage and tradition is going to inform us, direct us, tell us what are the plants that you think we should be looking at and we should be conserving. Now, I have a problem in that we do not recognize um, how flippant we are when it comes to um, clearing of land and clearing of plants. A lot of the plants that have been considered useful in our bioculture, if I may, are now found growing at the wayside. And why is that? That is because the land has become inhospitable to these plants. Yeah. And now relegated to the roadside, they're referred to as bush and weed, and mm -hmm. seed is not being useful. Yeah. But we've got about 60 um, plants that were recognized as valuable during the period of slavery on the island, when we know there was no systematic health care for those individuals. And that collection of um, 60 plants um, led to those people surviving, um, and these people are our ancestors. Yeah. So I'm saying that the bulk of that diversity, um, a percentage of it is still here, but we've lost. And in order, in order to hinder that, we need to um, give or add value to these plants so that we have a vested interest in their conservation, their usage, and the application into these new systems of agriculture. New agriculture in the context of finding out what we can do to provide a more hospitable setting for these plants to grow, and at the same time, do the research to find out what are the added value points that we can get out of this diversification. Yeah, one of the elements of this type of um, diversification that we're talking about is how do we capture the oral traditions, right? Mm -hmm. um, as you very rightly said, they have, it, it is so rich. I mean, you, you think about something as simple as when I was growing up, my mom would give us a purge. We call it the purge in Trinidad, right? Every, mm -hmm. before you go back to school. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a deworming and it's a cleansing of your system. Yeah. There right, you, um, but you didn't get the cold when you went back to school with everybody else, right? Um, you didn't, you didn't, um, you were healthier, you know, you had better bowel movement. It was all of those things, right? I mean, it was awful, <laughs> you <laughs> didn't want it, but it worked, it was, and that wasn't yeah. something that she got in a book, that was something that was passed on to her by her mother and her mother's mother. And so that oral tradition, and there are lots of yeah. people who still follow that, particularly persons yeah. who um, who may not have the means to be able to buy, you know, vitamins or buy supplements and that kind of stuff. There's a lot of things that, you know, traditionally that we use across That's the Caribbean, true. right? That's so true. not just in Barbados. Um, so that whole idea of the oral tradition being documented, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you know, I've been um, touting this whenever I get an opportunity to speak. Um, as you said, you know, in Barbados, uh, we may consider it fortunate. Um, some um, perspectives may look at it otherwise, um, but we've got a healthcare system um, that we can run to, you know, um, when we've got a sinus issue um, and we've got a cut that's not healing. Um, when we're concerned about our child having fevers during the night, um, there's somewhere we can run to. Um, but there are many uh, more isolated communities where these people um, have been living in harmony with nature, with that traditional knowledge, and they can step out of their doorstep and they can find a plant that's going to help with that fever. They're going to look for things like lemongrass. Yeah. Um, if you get that wound healed, they're going to look for maybe something like seaside sage or proton flavins, um, which 
based on what I'm hearing, um, that knowledge we can still find it here in the rural communities. Yes. Uh, the persons who are living intimately, still living intimately with our nature, our biodiversity, understand that if I don't protect and conserve what I need for survival, then it's going to impact on me. And they have much greater respect, um, unfortunately. And I'm not being negative here. I'm just saying, you know, in terms of how we have become developed, um, we have sort of negated the importance of that quality of tradition. Um, and I think it is time, it is time that whatever modalities we can use, um, that we do this reconnection. We have persons understand that the greenery around the home is of value. If yeah. nothing else is giving you oxygen to breathe, but there's more, you know, you're, you're walking on, you're cutting, you're spraying, things that once were the key to survival of our people on the island. If yeah. nothing else, we're asking for respect of traditional knowledge. Yeah. Um, but yes, so I tend to get emotional when I'm going down this path. <laughs> And justifiably so. Um, Earl, <laughs> Earl, Earl, one of our um, permaculture specialists uh, from Wasamaki Farms, he always says bush is good. He's like, we need to sell that slogan. He's like, it's simple, it's easy. He's like, we need to let people know that bush is good. Um, right. If you're just joining us and you're in the audience, um, we are talking to Dr. Sonia Peter. She is the founding and executive director of the Biocultural Education Research Program. She's also the founder and executive director of the Bioscience Barbados Limited and the founder of Heritage Teas Barbados. Um, Dr. Peters, let's, you know, we, we segue really well into, as you said, preserving these elements. There's also yeah. an economic aspect to it too, you know, because mm -hmm. one of the problems is I think that people don't see the value in these elements. So mm -hmm. this you use agriculture, how does it, yeah. how does it link to one food security, which is a very hot topic that everybody's talking about, right? And how is it also linked to the green economy? Another hot topic, a buzzword that everybody's talking about. So let's start yeah. with the first one, food security. Food security. Um, I, I think what we're going through now um, is a prime example as to why uh, we need to look at feeding ourselves. Um, so if I, I look at new use agriculture within that context, um, new use agriculture is not only reserved to bring in new plants into focus. So when I say new, um, plants that have been languishing as we become disconnected from their value. It also has to do with how we do agriculture. And I think that we recognize we can no longer um, solely look at external sources for our food. We talk about it all the time. It is a very, as you said, um, topical uh, point, and we hear it all the time, but are we truly acting on it? Yeah. I was happy to hear that one of the initiatives by our government is bringing um, somewhere around 700 acres of land back into production. But when we do that, we need to do this in a different way for me. Uh, we need to look at how we can make the land truly productive. Um, I will not pretend to be an agriculturalist, but these are some of the things that I think we have to look at differently. We have to be selective in terms of what we're growing. Um, uh, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization, and I mentioned this a little earlier, um, it is stated that there are 12 plants and five animals that 75% of our food depends on. Now that sounds really scary. Yeah. <laughs> because in the same way that we are being currently impacted by COVID-19, uh, plants and animals are similarly vulnerable. So if globally we are dependent on 12 plants and it gets worse than that, 60% um, of our protein and carbohydrate comes from three um, species. That's rice, wheat, and maize. Yeah. When anything happens to wipe those out, what do we do? So it's important that when we select um, the plants that we're going to put into production in that um, 700 acres, that we select um, the ones that are relevant to us. It mm -hmm. isn't 
um, all models that are in the um, developed territories that we need to employ. And that's the thing that they argue, you know, we've got abundant sun, um, we've got great soil, and I think that we need to look at what our soil is more likely going to allow us to get good crop yield. So yeah. new use agriculture in this context has to be how we do agriculture. Uh, we don't want to reap the nutrients out of the soil without plowing that back in. And I know that you work intimately with CPRI, so yeah. you need to have your permaculture systems active. Um, so new use agriculture not only looks at bringing new plants or underutilized plants to the forefront, but it also looks at our methodologies and our systems that we're going to employ. Yeah. Um, make sure that we can grow ample food. I know that Barbados is small, so we have to look at um, collaborations as well. We need to look at um, what is called green investment. Um, mm -hmm. We need to, to introduce other models, other economic models. Yeah. Uh, the money where to you know to be put into the systems that are important for our survival and food security is so vital um the other issue you asked about the green economy the green economy yeah. yeah i think it is all linked um I, I was reading recently about an initiative um making africa green i i noted it i may not have the um correct term but it's about um, making Africa green again. And, I, and I, I smile to myself because for my opinion, um, Africa has always been green. The mm -hmm. problem has been uh, mismanagement. Mismanagement, exactly, yeah. Mismanagement. Um, and why, when they say making Africa green again, um, surprisingly, it was not focusing on the sum total of greening in terms of green spaces. Yes. Uh, looking at um, the circular economy um, where waste was signature. Um, how do you cut back on waste? Which I know is very important. Um, but why is there all of this waste in Africa? Because again, um, we looked to the developed nation in terms of what they had to offer and incorporated their system. So, there's a ton of plastic waste, there's a ton of rubber, and what they're looking at is converting that waste into useful modalities. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the, you know, you, you talk about um, making Africa green again, but you know, you yeah. even think about the landscape of Barbados. And I mean, yeah. and in, in reading, when I first moved here, I thought, you know, the, the soil is pretty uh, dry here. You know, there's a lot of uh, penny plains with the cane, et cetera. Yeah. There's, um, in, in some areas, not a lot of biodiversity of plants. And then I discovered the gullies and I was like, yes. wow, it's like a yes. rainforest. And then in going and reading up on these things, I realized that the landscape of Barbados was forever changed through the monocropping of, of uh, sugarcane. And so you talk about making, making Barbados green again. Yes. Um, and I think about our project at Walker's Reserve that is a sand mine, right? Yes. And here we are growing fruits, vegetables, um, in silica sand, which yeah. people would say has no nutrient value. But That's as you right. said, it's through the techniques that you use. Um, and those techniques are all part of that move, that green economy movement, um, That's right. generative agriculture, what we're talking about in terms of you and the, the plants that we're using and using the different functions of the plants. Because from a chemical point of view, um, the plants also have um, a lot of functions within the soil of itself that's, and building the soil, right? That's and then you try to. If I may um, just interject a bit. No, um, no. I just, yeah, I just want to um, take the opportunity to congratulate Wired in terms of the project that you're doing. Um, just to say that, you know, as you described it, in terms of bringing life back to sand. Yeah. And that if you leave nature alone, um, nature has a habit of, you know, healing itself. It does. And we can't sit and wait on nature to heal itself. Um, it's programs like yours that can speed up the process for us all. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I know that um, the, the project has been moving swiftly and I'm happy to see the recognition that you're getting. And I know that it will turn out to be a model in restoration ecology for Barbados and the Caribbean. Yeah, um, I, 
We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, yeah, I, I was happy to have the opportunity to um, have Wired partner with me for our 2019 symposium in having our speakers um, be part of a planting ceremony. And these are many North American individuals and mm -hmm. they were so um, moved by the experience of making a contribution to the regeneration of land in that manner. Um, one of the speakers was so moved, I think she planted a cherry tree and she actually named it um, after one of her grands. I can't remember if it's a grand nephew or a son, what have you. Yeah. But and it after her um, grand, who was called Obama. Um, <laughs> she therefore left some positive energy for you. Oh, oh definitely. <laughs> but in, in, terms of, definitely. Um, uh, in terms of the green economy, um, as you said, it is about our green spaces. And we know that the tourism product um, has not evolved to the point where I believe it should evolve. Yeah. You know? bring our tourists to the island and we offer them a European or North American experience when they're looking for um, a, a Barbadian experience. And, and that's one of the things um, the speakers to our symposium remarked because I made a point to get them immersed one day into what Barbados has to offer. Nice. So we took them to some of the gardens, we took them to Wired, and of course we had them sample some of our rum because you have to but, of I, <laughs> um, but i'm saying this is what we need we need to recharge barbados with our green spaces because persons are looking for that when they come to a destination um yeah. little aside to show you how uh, we're not valuing what we have and we always look external um i remember being in st martin and uh, someone shared um, a clip with me. And it said that um, Martha Stewart, who we know to be, um, and we could define her as an astute businesswoman, mm -hmm. uh, started um, a cruise event called Bush Tea Cruises. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I don't know if you heard about that. No, I didn't hear about that. No. And, and what is Martha doing? Martha is bringing persons to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. persons to the Caribbean to take them to our green spaces <laughs> and she's taking them to our communities to have bush tea to have bay leaf tea my <laughs> <laughs> like granny used to make tea. <laughs> <laughs> you know but what I'm, what I'm saying here is, uh -huh. is that quality of experience that we should be offering our yes. um, sector in our tourist sector you yeah. know I, I I'm would sure those so, trips are not cheap, right? So I, it's, yeah. it is a money making endeavor, right? I, I a little put off <laughs> because I'm saying, but play her and not me. But she cruises, come on. Yeah. Um, and, and then I, I was privileged also around the same time to go to uh, World Tea Expo. And they pulled me aside and they said, you know what? I want next time you come here. Um, to come with your tourism connections mm -hmm. because we want to develop. At that time, I hadn't heard about um, Martha Stewart's um, Bush Tea Cruises, mm -hmm. but they wanted us to develop um, a tour along that line. We know that every year persons go to places like India yeah. Um, yeah. and other in China where they're steeped in the tradition of using their plants. Um, and these tours are set in the grand tea plantations. So persons go and they get immersed in that biodiversity and they get immersed in tea ceremony and the history and all of the bioculture associated with that. And um, I think that this is where um, they wanted me to develop such a tour where we um, invite persons into our green spaces. And again, right. this economic activity. Excellent. I think um, we're, we're going to segue into the to, to another question, um, yeah. but I, it definitely feeds off what we've been talking about. And that is the role of biodiversity conservation under the new use agriculture 
Um, and what role does that play in developing adaptive mitigation parameters for climate change? Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I know that you've been doing is that you've been profiling key biodiversity areas in Barbados. So, for example, the Scotland District, where Walker's Reserve is located, but also where a number of other green places are um, yes, located. Right, yeah. like Coco Hill Forest and all, and all of those other places, right. um, uh, Peg Farm, you know, yeah. um, and it's a, it's, it's a, how does, how do you, um, profile? Or, well, how does the profiling of biodiversity in that area work in terms of the resistance to to low um, rainfall, yeah. resistance That's to right. disease, resistant um, contribution to land stabilization? That's right. Yeah. So um, again, it, it's looking at the biodiversity we currently have, um, adding value and seeing how best we can apply that. Um, yeah. This aspect of our work is currently being done in collaboration with McGill Bellers Research Institute. Mm -hmm. um, every year for the past three years, I yes, three years, we've had groups that would come um, to the island to do their summer program. And we would have one group um, assist in going through the key biodiversity area of the Scotland district and looking again at plants that um, are not in the mind. You know, again, we walk over them, but we don't see how important they can be. Yeah. If we're going to collect data that can inform, and, and I call it um, adaptive, adaptive mitigation, because we know that uh, mitigation for climate change looks at sequestration of carbon dioxide. Um, but I also say that we need to look at how our plants can be shunted into the response, into yeah. the mitigation response. Um, and this is why I re refer to it as adaptive mitigation. So what is it we need to know about these plants? We need to know if in the Scotland district, we've got plants that are able to withstand low rainfall. We need to know if we've got plants that, that can stand higher than average temperatures. Mm -hmm. So what are the root systems of these plants? We know that root systems can travel laterally or we can have root systems that travel vertically. Um, what are the plants of these root systems? How do these root systems help us in terms of um, mitigating land slippage? and at the same time provide channels for irrigation water to naturally penetrate the soil. Yeah. Um, I, I, do, I do think that our project is a signature one. I'm not aware that we've got um, other groups working um, to profile these plants. And we hope to, at the end of the investigation, have about 50 plants that we can um, categorize in terms of their resistance to water loss. And we do mm -hmm. that by measuring the number of um, structures we call stomata the leaf has got at the top and the bottom through which it loses water. Yeah. And the parameters um, I've discussed, in addition to um, resistance to disease, because we know that with higher than average temperatures, that we're likely to see more pathogens emerge, uh, which pose problems to our plants and again, attack our biodiversity. Yeah. So if we look at the phytochemistry of plants in terms of what are the natural products the plants are producing and um, we've been doing that going into the lab we take our plant extract and we separate to see what the plant has there groups yeah. of compounds like alkaloids and flavonoids and terpenoids um, never mind the names they're just categories <laughs> uh, these are categories yeah. that um, build the plant uh, resistance in the plant you know, yeah. um, with the occurrence of COVID-19, um, we're understanding that one of the treatments um, to the virus is one that um, hinders replication of the viral um, messenger, if I want to put it that way, or the RNA in the virus. And there are plants that actually, because you know, plants are stationary. Um, they're not going to be able to run off to the uh, vet. That's a joke, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the plants themselves apparently mimic um, the RNA in a virus that's attacking 
and the plant will insert the mimic into the um, coding of the RNA and in so doing um, hinder development of the virus. Um, so this may be another element that I include yeah. in my filing in terms of looking at plants that have um, antiviral activities. Yeah. Well, so, I, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I am definitely um, going to beg for Wyatt right now and say, when you have that information, please share. <laughs> Um, well, so I, I know that we have a few questions from the audience, so I want us to have an opportunity for us to be able to um, address some of the questions from the audience. Um, yes, I do want us to um, also touch on the initiatives that you're working on. You did touch on some of them, but just to solidify it for the audience yes. so that they know the things that you're doing. Yes. Um, I will start off with, so what are the initiatives that you're working on? And we know that one of those initiatives is under the breadfruit tree. Um, and so if you could really quickly just run us through what it is that you hope to accomplish, what is under the breadfruit tree, what do you hope to accomplish with it? Yeah. Well, again, I, I draw on um, culture, heritage, bioculture. I mm -hmm. mean, breadfruit has um, a striking history when it comes to the Caribbean and Barbados. And yeah. so, yeah, what better than to invite um, a number of colleagues I have that are working to me at the front line in terms of research that can apply to the issues that we've been discussing here, uh, food security, health, biodiversity. And I thought, why not invite them under our virtual breadfruit tree uh, yeah. where we have discussions and sort of unearth and distill um, how plants are of value in looking at our current challenges. Oh, that's excellent. I know that you're also <laughs> launching a coloring book. Um, the, the, what, what's yeah. the app? Yeah, tell me more about this one. Yeah, so um, this coloring book, again, we're planting seeds of knowledge. And um, if we don't know about our plants, then we can't become vested in understanding them and also working to help in their conservation. Uh, so this coloring plant, this coloring book is targeting uh, both adults and children. And right. you can see an image of one of the very important plants in our food history. And I'm not going to identify it because I'm going to um, let the audience uh, tell me if they can look at the textual context because artist Lenore Aline, uh -huh. uh, who is known in the art world, both locally and internationally, um, works with collages. And it's so interesting that I'm um, talking with her a bit yesterday. She is saying that our responses to COVID-19 has to be one of collages where we take what we know and uh, immerse that with new strategies in allowing us to cope. So we'll oh, take nice. it sparkly and put it into our coloring book. And we're going to have 20 of our um, fruit trees um, in colored, in picture format and then coloring format so that you can become immersed in appreciating the beauty of the plant. At the same time, you're going to offer some information about the importance of that plant. So there's going to be an adult version and one targeting kids at school. Yeah, in the I same context, briefly, in the same context, we're going to develop an alphabet chart for the primary level. Um, mm -hmm primary level because we want to replace the alphabet that has A for apple and B for ball with A for aki and B for breadfruit as well as the remainder of the alphabet. Excellent. So it, so it really does feed it really does knowledge for the future. Right. Excellent. So it really does feed into the whole um, targeting schools and education communities with literature. I know That's that you're, you're also publishing a book, Beyond Bay Leaf, um, which is a, a fictional uh, book, but it's a synopsis of a fictional magical tale of plant <laughs> research fueled by traditional knowledge, heritage, kingship, yeah. and the African diaspora. Um, yeah. And then I would also just quickly ask you about the symposium, the one for 2021. It was supposed to be yeah. in 2020, but of course, because yes. of COVID, um, we've now had to reschedule most of our conferences. Um, yes. So uh, very quickly. Um, yes, so this is our um, 
signature <coughs> knowledge product for me. Uh, yeah. because I think it's important um, to share experiences, um, local experiences, uh, regional experiences, and of course include our international counterparts. So mm -hmm. here was our, um, our first iterate and though persons encouraged us to come forward this year, it's as if I had a premonition and I said, no, I'm going to go for 2021. So that was always the plan as we call okay. it biennial symposium. And we're going to have three sessions, one looking at the future of farming, one looking at biodiversity and the green economy, um, Bushti Cruises. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can get on that one. <laughs> All right, I know that um, plants are sources of healing, even if only to examine the healing power of a green space. Beautiful. All right, I know the audience is fighting at the tip. They're ready. They're ready to ask their question. So let's have the first question from the audience. All right, so a lot of traditional homeopathic remedies, a lot of traditional homeopathic remedies um have been lost through generations how can i add tap into this plant knowledge to add value and biodiversity to my garden farm and new and start new traditions and this is from one of our you new uh, youtube users so we're really happy that people are on our youtube page so yes mm -hmm. Dr. yes so thank you um very much for your question i think i recognize um the name associated with the question Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> um, it's in terms of knowledge sharing, and uh, we try to do this as often as we can, whether it's by publication. Um, but we've been uh, reached out to from someone in Trinidad who's asking us to deliver an online course where we cover um, information like this because it's very important, seeing that we have been disconnected. It's important that we reintroduce persons to what is good, um, how we should be using it, and what are the precautions. Because we don't want you to go out into your garden and see the first plant that comes to mind. <laughs> well, okay. Um, Dr. Peter said that we need to have a biodiversity, and then you have a bad experience. Uh, it's very important <laughs> that you gain knowledge. I said you. that Dr. Peter said so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's very important. Um, so we are actually hoping to have um, a resource center um, where persons can come in, they can spend time um, within our library, um, they can spend time um, interfacing with, um, you know, regional, international persons in sessions. So we are working to that. It, it's important to reconnect persons to the traditional knowledge, and that is where research and education comes in. Perfect. All right, let's have our next question from the audience. All right, and this question is from Patrick, and it says, why do we always take the latest fad from the Western world, even when it is destructive to us? Can't we leapfrog their pesticides and other negative external externalities? Yes. Um, Patrick, I think I will throw that question back to you. <laughs> um, it, it is about policy. Um, it is about confidence um, and it's about mechanisms. Um, I, I think, again, the disconnect has allowed us to think that our knowledge is not of value. Yeah. Um, and if you don't think your knowledge is of value, you're going to look externally, you know? And I know sometimes I get tired of having to say this, but um, external models will not always fit with us. And I think it's up to us. So this is the scientific community that we have. Um, this is our political directorate. Um, this is where I think we have to go. Um, and that, that whole paradigm shift to what I'm calling new use agriculture. We need to sit down and think about how best we can improve crop production for our people and what are the best strategies to employ without simply copying and adopting wholesale. So yeah. it has to come from collaboration of a number of entities to see that happen. And you know there is there is a huge amount of reconditioning that needs to take place because exactly mm -hmm. so we've been conditioned and yes. 
you know, simple elements such as that alphabet chart that has our local fruits and yeah. things on it. it. It seems like something that's very benign, but it's very powerful because you're teaching young persons from a very, very young age to appreciate the things, you know, it's, it's, it's a reconditioning process yes. that needs to happen. So yes, it needs to happen at the macro level, which is, you know, the policies, the government, the, that kind of thing, but it also needs to happen on a micro level in terms of just educating young persons, getting them to see and appreciate what we bring to the table as a Caribbean um, people, but also, you know, something that the, the beautiful things that were born out of a very difficult time in Caribbean history yes. um, and how those things can be appreciated and that we can feel proud of the things that were born out of a very yes. difficult time in our history without saying that it was a good thing, but yes. still being proud of the resilience that came out of the that. Resilience. Yeah. I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Do we have, yeah. Yeah. Do we have any more yeah. questions from the audience? All right, so this uh, question is from Sean Jean Cutting, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. Apologies if I didn't. Are there any plans to develop a nucleus of medicinal plants anyway? Yes. Um, so, you know, within our project, I didn't get a chance to talk about our living library, um, where we are working at Friendship Plantation in St. Andrew okay. to establish a living library of medicinal plants. And uh, for our project, we hope that that becomes nucleus and um, be a nucleus and signature in terms of how we can bring our plants back into focus um, in, a, in a natural and, um, you know, working with the harmony of nature. And so at Friendship Plantation, what we have begun to do is to label the plants of value um, work to reintroduce as many of them. You know, um, uh, when a child opens, um, a primary school child opens a book to read, <laughs> that child is not reading about its natural history. Um, I'm not sure how many kids know about fat forks and gooseberries and cashews. Um, so a mammy apple, I saw someone offering a mammy apple, young mammy apple plants, um, on Facebook, and I think I need to get one from my backyard. <laughs> so what we are trying to do there is to establish um, that unit, which is going to be bursting with plants of medicinal value. Um, we will have QR codes um, on those label plants, and persons can uh, come to the living library, use the modern technology, use your QR scanner, and it's going to take you to our bioscience club, um, which is a YouTube channel. It's now in development, um, but there you can enter our virtual library and learn more about plants from short clips, from lectures, from interviews, and then that follows up with the establishment of our resource center. So it's something that we are focused on working on, um, and we hope in finding the additional funding that we need. We are happy to say that the Global Environmental Facility Small Grants Program um, has provided working capital for the first two years, but we know that if we want to get our resource center and our bigger projects fully on stream, that we're going to be looking for um, fundraising mechanisms. Right. So investors, if you're listening, this is definitely a project because it's a worthy cause. Yes. Um, it sounds like a, a very scaled up and uh, much more academic, um, but very beneficial aspect of what we've actually just done at, at Walkers 2. We've, we've just yes. done signs with QR codes, yes. but just with basic information about the plants that are specific to Walkers okay. and that environment, um, you know, what they're, what they're traditionally used for across the Caribbean. But definitely having this type of library would be excellent. Um, I know we have more questions from the audience. Um, so let's have another question from the audience. And this is from Anne Jolie Topaz um, on Facebook. How do we overcome the belief that herbal medicine is inferior and risking treatment for medical conditions? Good question, yeah. Anne Jolie. Yes, and, and I do appreciate and understand that. And um, the reason for that, you know, there's, there's truth and there's also fiction there. Um, in, the, in Europe, um, I was going to say European Union, but I'll just say Europe, 
um, they've got such confidence in their traditional use of plants and medicine that you can purchase over the counter. And what they use to measure whether that can happen is they'll say, well, if this plant has been used for a period of 30 years without any significant negative narratives associated with that plant, then you think that it is one that we accept is important in terms of the traditional usage and you can purchase that over the counter. Um, yeah, so because we, and then of course we know about um, the other systems, um, Chinese, Ayurveda, et cetera, where the confidence there has been sustained over centuries. Mm -hmm. Our problem um, is that we have been disconnected and when you're disconnected, the confidence is in there. Now, though I will throw caution to someone stepping out of their doorstep and selecting the plant and go trying it, their families, their families that have come up steeped in the tradition and know what works for them. Those people, I say, you practice your tradition as you have been practicing it. I had the fortune to have a chat with the lovely centenarian who was 105 this year. And uh, her children would tell me that, um, and she did as well. And I, I had a little um, issue because I did post about her on my Facebook page, a bit of her story that I'm gonna tell you. And persons jumped on it calling her a slave. And I do not like that term. Uh, but she told me that she was working in the plantations from when she was nine years old. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, harsh hours. And uh, she fought her way um, through that and had, I think it's about 12 children, raised them all. And they told me that it was a tradition in their household for their mother to leave home and come back with a basket of her plants. And she would have plants that they would use as a tonic. She would have plants that they would use to have a good night's rest. She would have plants that they could use if they've got cold or flu. She knew um, how many plants you should mix, what you should not mix. She could tell them how many leaves of a given plant you should use, whether three leaves of this, five leaves of that. So yeah. this is a walking oh, recipe book. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And she lived to 105. And I do have, believe that the centenarian population we have here, the stories are similar. Yeah. And, and that needs to be told. And we've started by doing a documentary called Healing Roots. And okay. um, I did not interview the 105 year old because I didn't want to be invasive. But we have some interviews with persons who are steeped in that tradition. And it is about reconnecting. And so we hope to be the conduit to connect our new public with our old public and building that bridge of confidence. And if we can build that bridge of confidence via education and research, then I think that we will be able to demonstrate um, the value of traditional um, knowledge when it comes to plants as medicine. And we hope that it will even make its way into conventional um, approaches in terms of how, you know, we address some of the health issues that we do have. Wow, amazing. Uh, Dr. Peter, I, I, you know, I feel like we needed two hours instead of just <laughs> one hour to talk about this, the, uh, you know, the breadth of the work that you're doing, but there's also so many issues to unpack. Yes. Um, Around the bi the whole the whole concept of biodiversity, biodiversity. new use ag uh, new use agriculture within yes. the Caribbean context within a post colonial society. Um, right. I am going to uh, push for one more question. <laughs> <laughs> um, my team in the background is probably like, no, we're out of time. <laughs> um, so that question is: Could we learn from other coral islands agriculture to find suitable plants to help rebuild Barbados biodiversity? And this is from Chloe. Um, so we have really a little bit amount of time, uh, Dr. Yeah. Peter. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we know that the other islands are um, much more biodiverse than we are. 
uh, we lost a lot of our plant cover because of sugarcane agriculture. Um, and though we only have two endemic species relative to areas that sometimes can peak at 50% um, endemicity, meaning that, you know, the bulk of their plants are special to their um, territory, their island, what have you. Uh, we, we do have plants in common and we have to be careful in terms of what we, we pull back into our system. And again, that can only be done um, with the research aspect of it uh, right. in terms of what we select. Yeah, because we still do have to make these approaches in a cautious way. All right, that is an excellent, very quick answer. Um, and we appreciate it so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter, for joining us. Thank you um, so much. Wishing you the best of luck in all of the endeavors that you have going forward. Looking forward to an episode of Under the Breadfruit Tree. I will look out for it. Um, yes, please do. If you've missed today's session or you've missed part of the today's session, don't worry. It is going to be available on Wyatt's YouTube channel. We will also have the link to Dr. Peter's um work in the in the in the comment section um and please do join us next week tuesday when jen rod from cpri will speak to mahmoud patel um uh, the owner of coco hill forest um that's going to be a very exciting conversation about how one man's passion has led to um for one man's passion for regenerative agriculture has led to um a sustainable ecotourism model and then of course join me again on thursday when I speak to Annalise Davis, um, artist, climate change activist, um, and looking at how art works within the realm of climate change. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, come out next week. Please do answer our polls. We are looking to find out from you when is the best time. Go to our Facebook page. Go to our Instagram um, page and click. Tell us what you think. Thank you very much and have a good day.